Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Night Mode Radio here on Snorri Time. I am your host, Kenny Hill, and I am very excited to be back making chill, late night radio DJ vibes type content. I had a fabulous week this week. I went to Silverwood Theme Park for the first time this season, which was absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I also got dental surgery. I had a tooth anchor implanted into my jaw. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, she sounds like she's in no pain whatsoever. And you would be absolutely right. I am in no pain. I had just a textbook experience. Things are going really well. I don't know what I did uh, to deserve such a blessing, but I'm very, very thankful for it. Um, This has been a a long process that started back in March, actually, when the tooth first gave way. And then I had my tooth extracted shortly after that. So it's just, it's just been a few long months and then a few more months from now is when the whole ordeal will be over but very thankful that it's going well right now at least um by the way if you are enjoying these sweet lo-fi animal crossing beats you should know that this week's music is brought to you courtesy of Game Chops. Uh, Game Chops was the world's first record label dedicated to video game remixes and cover songs. So if you hear something you like during today's show, you can find a link in the description to their website as well as uh, a link to their video game study lounge here on YouTube, uh, which is full of video game inspired music. It's very cool as always, to find music that you can use here on YouTube that, like, fits your theme. Starting off this week, let's talk about some some news that you might have been seeing in the gaming industry. I uh, saw this article courtesy of, I think it was CNBC, uh, video game sale projections are... Uh, down 1.2% for 2022, bringing the the total for the whole industry globally down to 188 billion, that is billion with a B, dollars, uh, which is is just crazy. Uh, That's a $1.9 billion decrease uh, for just this year. And the reason that's such a big deal is because over the last couple of years and the whole uh, COVID pandemic and things like that, uh, the industry had seen a 26% increase in just the last couple of years and had been trending upward since 2015. So it's been a good time to be in the video game industry apparently, which I find surprising because a lot of, I feel like the news that I was seeing surrounding development studios and these companies over the last few years have been things like firing personnel, downsizing, And just a whole slew of of those kinds of things that would have led me to believe that maybe these companies were not doing as financially well as one would think. Now, I'm sure that like really truly does depend on which studio in particular you you might be looking at. Uh, But in general, it seems like it's been a very, a very healthy time. Uh, Piers Harding Rolls, the director of Ampere Analysis, where this data comes from, uh, says that this this data that they're they're putting forth right now shows that the industry isn't recession proof, right? And I think we can probably all agree that most industries aren't recession proof. Um, but to me, this shows that it is perhaps an indicator 
of the world returning to normal. Nature is healing. Um, a lot of people I know picked up video games again during the pandemic after a really long hiatus away from them. They hadn't been playing as much recently due to work and time constraints and just getting older in general because I am part of the the older set and a lot of people were picking up gaming for the first time in their lives during the pandemic. Uh, it, this includes of course things like mobile gaming and I'm sure consoles like the Switch performed really really well. Obviously, a lot of the, the new console gen generations that came out, PlayStation 5 specifically, you know, have been harder to get the, your hands on because of supply chain interruptions and things like that. I know a lot of friends of mine still don't have a PlayStation 5 uh, and they have to, to stay on the hunt for it, um, which apparently hasn't been as big of a deal if sales are still so high within the industry if the growth overall is still so well and of course Ampere is projecting that the upward trend will return by 2023 uh, so this is a very temporary sort of um, contraction in the industry or at least that is what they're claiming I will be very curious to see uh, what this means as studios feel the pinch over this next year if that will lead to more downsizing if that will lead to more games you know getting priced at like that 70 dollar mark as we're, we're already seeing with the the last of us remake uh, a lot of game companies seem to have been pushing for that more recently um and I would love to hear people's thoughts on on what they think is a, a reasonable price tag. I think it's interesting that AAA titles have sort of continued to increase in price. Um, but there's so much pushback on, on talks of increasing that price. Whereas indie games or games from smaller studios uh, aren't valuated the same it seems like people have a harder time justifying those price tags you know they expect something from an indie studio to be under $25 maybe I don't know where other people really put their their threshold for that their tolerances for those experiences I am happy to pay a pretty hefty sum for even a small like tight quality product uh, but I think it's just a good reminder that video games are absolutely a, a luxury not a necessity it is an expensive hobby to to have um, but one of the things I think people are really going to start seeing over the next six months as cost of living increases as the economy is struggling sort of in general is more of these talks more of um companies putting forth the idea of more expensive games so it'll be interesting to see how how the dialogue plays out between the consumers and these these development studios and companies uh playstation sounds like they're already maybe trying to get ahead of the curve they did they announced uh that sometime this year, I don't believe there was a specific date, they would be launching their PlayStation Stars program, which is a, a loyalty program for players within their ecosystem where they could earn points that can be redeemed for PlayStation Network wallet funds and thus traded in for items worth real money now. You, if you just heard that um, without any other context, you'd probably think NFTs, um, which Grace Chen wanted to be uh, very sure that people understood that this was absolutely not NFTs, definitely not, uh, to quote her. 
It's definitely not NFTs. Definitely not. You can't trade them or sell them. It is not leveraging any blockchain technologies and definitely not NFTs. And to that, I would say for now, right? Companies know at this point how uh, averse gamers are currently to the idea of NFTs. Uh, they don't want you to be mad at them, and I don't think they want you owning things either. Uh, I have I have very mixed feelings on that. I like the idea of certain uh, utility within the use of non-fungible tokens. That is probably a discussion for another time. Most of these rewards that PlayStation is playing with are specially themed standalone games, game add-ons, and digital collectibles, probably things like cosmetics, I would imagine, earned through completing certain campaigns, like obtaining a specific achievement, playing a certain amount of time on a particular title, or being the first to platinum a title in a certain region, which I actually think is really cool. I think there's a lot of very interesting community dynamics that can happen when you have a an ecosystem where players can recognize what other players have done because of these sort of trophies, basically. I often, when I'm on Steam, for example, will look at my friends' achievements in the games that we, we both play and it, it can be really telling about, oh, they, they had this sort of achievement, this ending, or if they actually did complete all of the achievements for a game, they spent a lot of time on it. It's like, oh, they must have really enjoyed that. Um, I think it'd be interesting to do a deeper dive into the psychology of, of achievements. I know there are plenty of gamers out there who don't care at all about unlocking achievements, achievement hunting, finding rare achievements, or things like that. I don't know if the idea of this loyalty program would change their minds about that. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you can really encourage in a player's psyche through these sort of um, extrinsic motivations. I think that's something that's sort of intrinsically within a gamer or not. Like there's just, it's just sort of this binary situation. Because of course that's what this all comes down to, is the idea of keeping players within their ecosystems and captivating and capturing your attention. Because that attention leads to money if you're playing a game and you know that if you play for a certain amount of time, you'll get these rewards, or if you have to complete a certain challenge, you might be tempted to participate within the in-game economy in a certain way. I don't know. I, I am definitely going to keep my eye, as I usually do, on the developing story here and see how it transforms over time. Because it's one thing to say, hey, this isn't NFTs right now, or it won't, but that's, it's saying it's not NFTs doesn't means it won't, doesn't mean it won't ever be NFTs, right? And again, I am not a whole wholesale nay naysayer of NFTs. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops if they are truly wanting to, to capture uh, and retain players on a totally different track when we were talking about, you know, the idea of retaining players and sort of monopolizing them inside your ecosystem. I came across uh, a cool community post um, about the Steam Deck of all things, which began, you know, rolling out earlier this year, if you could get one, right? Again, these supply chain situations affecting everyone, including, you know, Valve and, and their ability to get the Steam Deck out. Um, if you've had a chance to play with it, of course, it allows you to access the Steam library. Um, and it's also built on the Linux framework, uh, which means that 
it's open source basically you can get in there you can tinker with it you can do some pretty cool things including you know desktop mode kind of like normal pc functionality um but there's this whole community that has developed around the steam deck and sort of homebrewing their own functionality into the device uh playing things like vinyl records for instance uh or vhs tapes I would love to see how someone was able to to mod a Steam Deck to play a VHS tape. I have no idea like what would actually need to happen in order to make that a reality, but it sounds really cool. And in fact, Microsoft, according to this Axios article, has been gleefully providing a step-by-step -step guide to help Steam Deck users take advantage of its Xbox Cloud Gaming and access mini games on the Game Pass service. Um, because of course, again, you just have this other avenue in which gamers can access your products. And it's this sort of symbiotic relationship, which is very, very refreshing to see because Nintendo, my, my favorite, is sort of notorious for being very anti-consumerist, um, I suppose, in that way. They don't want you accessing their products through any outside means. They're very stingy about maintaining their, their ecosystem. And apparently there's actually this open source launcher called Heroic, uh, which is allowing players to attach Steam's biggest rival, the Epic Game Store, to the device as well, which I just think is very cool. You have a handheld console that is basically acting as your one-stop shop if you have the technical prowess to, to accomplish these things. Your one-stop shop for all your gaming needs, just about, because they also can run emulators, which means if you legally own a ROM of a game because you bought it and you have the read-only memory, the ROM, you slap that right into your emulator on your on your Steam Deck, and you're and you're you've pretty much got everybody covered, just about, just about, which is good news for gamers, I think, to have that kind of whole hog experience on one device because as a gamer myself i was really locked into the nintendo ecosystem for a long time that was the ecosystem that my family bought into and so i just sort of by default inherited my gaming ecosystem we never had any of the playstations or xbox my friend her older brother had the original PlayStation, he would come over and bring the console. So it was something I was exposed to, but it wasn't our primary mode of of gaming media. And so I just think that's really interesting, especially when you consider that the EU is sort of cracking down on Apple and allowing the the app downloads to be accessible outside of the app store south korea doing a very similar thing uh, with apple and google um, trying to get them to allow developers to accept payments outside of their internal systems and just giving more control flexibility back to the developers and if that just trickles down into the consumer side where we have more flexibility options for how we want to play these games on what devices we want to play these games so I don't have to own 15 consoles when you can especially when you consider legacy content that you know I can, not everything is backwards compatible so if I have to own a GameCube I have to own a GameCube there's just, there's just no way around it. Or there are fewer ways around that, of course. 
There's always a way around something. I'm just saying. And if that doesn't make you happy, if the idea of that doesn't make you just gleeful uh, to have, have that becoming the norm, perhaps, in the gaming system, uh, here's a little piece of news uh, from neurosciencenews.com, um, which, as far as I could tell, is a, is a reputable source of information. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for psychology news, other types of news surrounding gaming. I was a psychology major. That is what I, what I majored in um, in university. But the title of this article is Video Game Players Show Enhanced Brain Activity and Decision-Making Skills. And this will not surprise anyone, I would imagine, who's actually a gamer, right? Because... If you're a gamer, you know. But what's important here is how dedicated psychologists have been in this field, which is is really gaining some notoriety recently. I've had the opportunity to talk to a handful of psychologists whose primary focus is uh, in the gaming sphere and and seeing how they have really combated the negative press that gamers have historically received in the media, in the mainstream. And so I just think this is is so cool, um, but not surprising, again, whatsoever, because I am myself a gamer. Uh, but the sort of synopsis is that video game players are faster and more accurate in their responses and excel at decision-making tasks. The difference in accuracy and reaction time correlated with enhanced brain activity, the source being a study from Georgia State University. And anecdotally, the lead author of the paper described their experience with using games to train their uh, weak eyes as a child and, and using them as a sort of physical therapy, um, playing games with their non-dominant eye in order to strengthen them and, and go from legally blind in that one eye to higher functioning, being able to participate in things like paintball and sports like lacrosse, which I just think is, is hits me personally because I also have a eye situation, I suppose, that is that is caused by weak musculature and nerve function as opposed to the actual shape of your eyeball right so if you if you wear glasses typically typically it is the lens of the glass is correcting and accounting for a deformity in the lens of your cornea and that is how most people are dealing with their their eye situations now there are things like astigmatisms uh, which are a specific kind of deformity. And then, of course, people with poor nerve function, poor muscle function, like myself. And so seeing if things like gaming can be beneficial to those suffering with, like, physical issues and strengthening and training how that affects our brain development over time, especially because younger and younger people are playing video games for longer and longer periods of time. And so having a whole field dedicated to how gaming actually affects us psychologically, physically, is really important because those are things that we might understand anecdotally and sort of instinctually as gamers we hear these things and we're like oh yeah duh that makes so much sense like of course that's just how it works but so many people you have to remember are not gamers are not entrenched in the gaming community like so many of us are <laughs> you know so that's the good news that that was that really brightened up my week when i saw that um but it is time for a little break. 
Uh, I'm trying to do this in like the very sort of live format, live radio. It's been about 25 minutes since we started up. If you've been listening along, whether you're gaming, studying, relaxing, thank you for joining me. Uh, be sure to take a moment, do a little body check, check your needs. Since we were just talking about gaming and the effects physiologically that we might experience from that, as well as psychologically, check in with yourself. See if you need to hydrate, grab a snack, stretch a little bit, take a little break, do whatever you need to do. Now, one of the biggest things in gaming that I am excited for in this upcoming week has to be the stray game from Annapurna. I am very, very excited for this game where you play as a stray cat in a sort of cyberpunk, robotic, dystopian, perhaps, future. And that is releasing in just a couple of days from now. If you are interested in catching my first impressions of that, that will probably be up on the channel within a few days of release, if we're being honest. There are such high expectations for this game for me personally. I grew up, as any little girl does, pretending to be a cat. And so you have a game which, as far as I can remember, is really the first game that has ever sort of presented to you like, you are a cat. This is this is your experience. Experience. This is what we're trying to capture for the player, is what it is like to be a cat. Now, certainly, in a very specific kind of world, uh, and whether or not that world really reflects our own, our own world and our own real world cat's experiences remains to be seen. But if they don't get this right, there's going to be a lot of backlash for this game. So I'm really excited to see like what, what the actual reviewers come out and say about this. I am really looking forward to sharing my experience here on the channel with you all. Uh, and speaking of, of things that we have high expectations for, Nintendo... Uh, just announced that they will be acquiring Dynamo Pictures, who worked on their Pikmin shorts. I will leave a link to that in the description because I had no idea these even existed. And oh boy, I watched the first one and I'm like, this is kind of dark. Like for Nintendo, this is this has a very dark kind of adult humor undertone. Uh, so I really appreciated that. I very much highly recommend you check them out if you haven't already. What's interesting to me is that uh, they will be closing on that sometime in October, I believe. But I'm wondering what that really means for Nintendo's relationship with Illumination Studios Paris. Uh, because that is the studio that is working on the current Mario movie. And they've also worked on things like... Um, Minions, and I believe the Lorax as well, Despicable, Despicable Me, of course. Um, and so with the announcement, I think a few weeks back now, that the Mario movie was going to be delayed because they quote unquote wanted to find or they wanted to present the best thing that they could. Um, it makes me wonder if maybe the relationship between Illumination Studios Paris and Nintendo is a little strained, perhaps, in the artistic uh, direction and collaboration that would be necessary, of course, to make a Mario movie come to life in a way that everybody is happy with. Um, and because Nintendo has worked with Dynamo Pictures in the past to create these shorts, um, I don't know if that means they will maybe move to turning that studio into a more feature length animation studio or if they will keep doing more shorts. It'll be interesting 
interesting to see what's happening there and if more news comes out about the production of the Mario movie if there's more I don't want to say gossip I feel like gossip is just such a nasty word information you know I'm not looking to see them fail I want it to be really good I like the actors I like the idea of a Mario movie especially when you see how more relaxed Nintendo has been with their IP recently um I'm thinking of like the Mario Rabbids crossover and just how delightful that was. How delightful it has been to see these beloved IPs in the hands of other people, other creatives who can bring something fresh to the table while still maintaining the the integrity of of the characters, right? It's a hard thing to do. I think it's a very hard thing to do. It's sort of like anything where you ask somebody to make a recipe right you give them all the ingredients all the directions and like yes it's great when somebody can just execute the recipe exactly as described and it tastes just like grandma's but how much more delightful is it if it's like they added something a little different to like that reflects themselves and it's like grandma's but different, but still just as good. I don't know. Maybe is that a weird analogy? It might just be a weird analogy. Don't worry about me. It's fine. We also had the delightful surprise of Kirby's Dream Buffet being announced as well during this week, which is interesting. Uh, like just a just a random drop with a summer 2022 release but no specific date which was really weird considering we are we are smack dab in the middle of summer so i don't know why they wouldn't just give us a release date unless they were shadow dropping it like same day but they didn't so i, I I'm, I'm very confused it looks like a cute game i'm a kirby fan i also am like a Fall Guys fan. I know people have compared it to Fall Guys. Whether or not that's actually like a legitimate comparison remains to be seen. I think there's some aspect of that, of course, with the competitive nature. To me, it looks more like resource racing. Like the the better you do throughout the obstacle course, you know, the more food that you that consume. And if you're in first place along the course, then you have like first dibs on all of these food resources. I don't know. It'll be interesting to say like the actual gameplay, how that ends up playing out. But it looks cute. I love a good couch co-op, even though I don't have anybody to play them with. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I don't know if they made any announcement actually about online capacity, if there will be any sort of online play. It'd be kind of a shame if there wasn't, just because every game that releases along these veins, like Mario Party, I'm always eager to have an online component at launch. Please, at launch, give it to me. I, I don't know if we'll get it though, but I'm looking forward to it. I don't know if they'll just shadow drop it or if they'll do some other big announcement once it actually releases we'll have to we'll have to wait and see um but i know something you may have missed as far as announcements and things go uh i know i missed it and it had its moment is the the point p i don't even know if i'm pronouncing that right point p the netflix and devolver digital collaborative game uh that released um through netflix's mobile games app a very strange situation. I know Netflix has been getting a lot of flack recently um, about some of their business practices, and it does seem awfully weird for them to be moving into the gaming space over this last year. It's just, it's insane. But they did release Point P uh, over the last few weeks. I decided to download it uh, because I am leeching off my mother's Netflix account like a good daughter. 
and I know she wasn't gonna play point B, so I'm like, oh, all right, try, try it, try it out. It is a very cute game. It has very much like speed running type elements, uh, resource management. It's very satisfying. And it's very easy to just play a few rounds and put it down, which I actually think is an interesting thing that it doesn't really feel like I have to be sucked into like hours and hours of grind. Every run, because it's sort of a rogue light, feels unique. And so it's satisfying to see how far I get every single time without having to be like, oh, I have to complete the next level. Because that's, that's what gets me, is I get to a level that I'm struggling with and I think to myself, oh, just one more try, one more try, one more try. And I will one more try myself into insomnia and suddenly it's 7 a.m. and my phone is like about to explode from the heat, right? So it's like, it's a, it's a problem. It is a problem. I don't feel that problem as much with point P. Now, when I was looking into this, because I, I missed the original release, um, I found out that Netflix had also done a mobile release of the game Moonlighter, uh, which I remember playing on the Nintendo Switch. Again, another sort of rogue light experience. Um, and, and, and that just sort of flew by a couple of months ago and just no fanfare. I don't know if I just don't sit in the target demographic for their marketing. Maybe I'm too old. It's, it's impossible to say. I don't know. Isn't Netflix targeted at old people? Maybe I should be in the target. I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It just seems like the kind of thing that really flew under the radar if you weren't already a Moonlighter fan, like keeping your eyes out for that information. Or like, I don't follow Devolver Digital, so I don't know if I I wouldn't have seen the, the Point P information when that launched. And so I didn't, I missed it completely. Um, and that is why wonderful things like this show exist. I do wish there was actually more gaming news channels on YouTube like that actually just share their news and maybe their opinions about things that just don't get so angry. I feel like a lot of them are very drama filled and they focus, they hyper focus on maybe a piece of news that they didn't like. And I mean, it sells, <laughs> it sells, it gets views. What are you going to do? Another thing you might have missed out on this last week is Luke Stevens releasing his latest and greatest uh, video game essay on Elden Ring, A Beast Out of Control. Now, if you're a fan of Luke Stevens, you're already familiar with his long form video essay content. Um, I was just surprised to see the Elden Ring essay kind of coming out so late when so many video essayists have already like pumped out their video on the game. I have not yet uh, on my, my other channel, Simple Bean, where I do do video essays, have not covered Elden Ring yet. Um, it's in the works. It's a big game, okay? There's, there's a lot to say, which is why Luke Stevens' essay is three hours long. So... A link to that will also be in the description. Just know and be prepared for three hours of your life being dedicated to that. I highly recommend turning it on like when you're doing chores. Um, also watching it like after you've already finished the game or a pretty pretty much a good chunk. He's gonna he talks about everything. So you have to decide how like spoiler sensitive you are to that sort of thing and like if that's going to really truly affect your enjoyment of the game I don't experience that luckily because I will forget I'll forget everything it will feel so brand new it is it is the one good thing about my brain is is entertainment media comes in 
to my eyeballs and then I think it drains out my brain stem right at the back like and it's just like the holes are big nothing's getting trapped in there I do I do find myself getting sucked down these like rabbit holes though of, of video essays and thoughts and that was just now with like the giant holes comment making me think of um these trays that I put in my fridge we're gonna go on a little tangent here for a second <laughs> I reorganized my fridge recently I had a little panic moment so for those of you who maybe don't know I had to um sort of put together an emergency setup um, because my PC broke. Like it, it bricked hard. Like the BIOS would not boot up. So I am currently borrowing a laptop, which will eventually become my primary machine. But in the meantime, like I can't, this won't be edited. You guys are getting the raw deal right now. There will be no edit. This is going straight to YouTube as is recorded live like a like a real podcast or like radio show I suppose or stream I didn't want to stream it just because like I too much to deal with people right now it, it is the season of breaking everything is breaking um but I re reorganized my fridge and uh because I was having these manic moments and I decided to buy some organizational trays from the dollar store which is now the dollar 25 store if we're being honest because again inflation the economy cost of living everything's going up it's it's rough but i had found some very wilted vegetable at the back of my fridge because i have a deeper shorter fridge i live in a basement i'm renting and I was just like, I can't live like this anymore. <laughs> it was just, it was a little, again, it was a manic moment. You, you get those sometimes. And so I went to this dollar store, grabbed, they're about three inch trays, maybe by like 14 or 16 inches deep. And then probably 12 inches wide. So like two trays shelf it's like a wire shelf and that way I could organize all of my groceries into these trays have things all the way in the back but when I need them when I need my spinach for my smoothie I can instead of having to pull out everything that's in front of that item I can grab the tray and slide it out like a drawer and I was like this is a stroke of genius and I'm like, I know I saw that somewhere. I saw it on Pinterest. I saw it on some vlog, perhaps. And so the specifics are lost in this colander that is my brain. But like a little nugget of something stuck, but most of it gone. I can't give credit for that idea. I had a friend come over and I saw they, they looked in my fridge and they were just like, that moment of confusion that you see play across someone's face and then like that realization like, oh, this is actually sensible. This makes sense. Like maybe I should do this. <laughs> I love it. It was a good time. I, I really do love it when I see stuff like that or, you know, updating my my streaming setup trying trying to get things to work in the meantime like while I'm in this season of breaking and transition and stuff and trying to still make things for everyone because I because I like to make things I love that beat oh that's a good one Again, if you are enjoying the music, be sure to check out Game Chops. Links in the description, of course. 
And for those of you who are going to be going to bed after this, let me just give you a little, a little bit of a life tip, a little bit of a hack, if you will. Small tablespoon of peanut butter before you go to sleep. If you're the kind of person who has trouble sleeping, especially if you go to bed late, because it's been a while since you've had dinner, right? And you don't want to eat again because you're like, oh, if I eat like a whole meal or whatever, I'm not going to be able to sleep well. Again, I'm old. I get indigestion. It's a thing. A little bit of peanut butter, something that's like high quality fats, protein, that's going to keep your blood sugar more stable throughout the night as you sleep. So you're not going to wake up as angry, right? You're going to be able to fall asleep a little bit better and sleep a little bit better in general. This is a hack I learned because I am hypoglycemic. I was talking to a friend recently and they're like, yeah, my kids aren't sleeping through the night. They want to snack and snack and snack. Peanut butter. It's good for kids. It's good for adults or, or almond butter or some other, again, fatty protein kind of snack. Cheese was another one that I often got as a child. And then first thing in the morning, because your stomach has emptied out, have like, I hate eating breakfast. What Like I love breakfast food, actually. It's my favorite kind of food in the world. But eating a big meal right, if, right after waking up is just like a horrifying reality that I will not face. But having something that you can eat really easily within the first 30 minutes of waking up, that's gonna like neutralize your stomach acids. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what makes me comfortable as somebody who's old now and has to deal with like bad sleep just because I'm old. Stupid. Minus Fig Newtons. I can eat two Fig Newtons back to back sometimes. Sometimes it's just one. I can make my tea. I can get some other things, but at least I have something in my stomach like within the within moments of waking up. Yours might be fruit. Banana can work really well. Plus that has a lot of other benefits for your gut. Super, super awesome. If you can stand it, I just don't eat a lot of fruit. I don't keep a lot of fruit around because it, go it goes bad. <laughs> I want like green tinged bananas. And so that only is like two days and then it's done in my books. And I don't make banana bread or anything. I don't have anything to do with the like overripe bananas. Yogurt can be a really good one. Another one that's really good for your gut, probiotics, protein. It's awesome. But just get something in there. Kind of bookend your, your sleep with the things that are going to best facilitate your body. And we'll talk about like mental bookends for sleeping another time. Because I think that's all the time we have for today. That actually was going to take a lot longer than I thought. I had all these topics that I maybe wa maybe wanted to talk about. Having a having a good mix of sort of gaming news, plus things that have been on my mind, plus just like real life practicality and living, presented in that sort of late night radio DJ vibe for you guys because I know some of you are going to be using this to fall asleep some of you are going to be using it to study maybe as a companion for relaxation however you use it feel free to let me know in the comments let me know if you want me to talk about certain things resources for learning book recommendations I have occupational ADHD so like I know a little bit about a lot of things it's a good time so I'm interested to know what you're interested in. But that's going to be everything for today. I hope you enjoyed this first episode. And if you would like to help me out, be sure to like the video, share it with a friend, or check out, you know, my other channel, Simple Bean, here on YouTube. That's where I post the, the video essays if that's something you'd be interested in. And I will catch you next week. <laughs>